Hi guys, I'm Chantal with Growing Up Without Borders. Welcome to our travel channel. We are a traveling family. We go around the world making really cool videos for you. And right now we are in quarantine in the country, beautiful country of New Zealand. We're gonna connect with another traveler. This is the youngest guy who has traveled, the youngest American, I should say, who has traveled to every country in the world, including the North and the South Poles, and I believe every single state in the United States. So without further ado, let's quickly connect with Lee Abamonte. He's a really cool guy. Um, you can find him everywhere. If you haven't heard of him already, you're gonna meet him right now. Hey, how are you doing? Good, what's going on? <laughs> Not too much. Well, actually a ton of stuff. We're in quarantine, but we're getting a lot of stuff done. So it's really good. Nice, uh, and you guys are in New Zealand, is that right? Yeah, we are in Queenstown, New Zealand. I think one of the safest places to be right now. That might be my singular most favorite place on earth. Is it? For real? Yeah. I love it there. Love it. Oh my gosh. Right now you're in New York, right? So, yeah. and you guys, uh, how are the, how's the morale and how are you guys hanging in there? Yeah, I mean, yeah, it sucks, but I mean, uh, New Yorkers are pretty resilient to stuff. So, you know, we're just dealing with it. Uh, do what you gotta do. I mean, we can, we can go outside unlike like Spain or Italy or something like that. So, I mean, yeah, it sucks, but at least you can like go to Central Park. Like today I walk like 10 miles, you know what I mean? Oh, wow. So, yeah. Nice. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You're not in total confinement like some of these other countries that are, I was just yeah. talking to friends in Spain. They can't even go out. They have to borrow dogs and stuff like that to have an excuse to leave the house. <laughs> yeah, 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 exactly. Yeah. People are inventing reasons to leave. So. Yeah. So cool. So when were you here last in Queenstown? um god it had to be about three years ago probably and i've been there i don't know uh several times uh the first time i was there i was there for like a month and uh man it was uh 2003 and me and my like best friend we uh we went down there and just we bungee jumped like 30 times uh skydived uh did the luge did the shot over jet you know the the, the canyon swing whatever did it all it was great oh my gosh. Well, for us, we're here and we want to do some of those things. I, I'm, we're not going to go as crazy as you with like the whole jumping off like cliffs and like bungee jumping and such. But uh, I mean, everything's closed down, right? So it's a totally different Queenstown yeah. than what you would have experienced. People come here for those thrill things, right? Do they still have a place called like Fur Burger or something like that? If they do, I don't know. Like oh, we okay. arrived the day of lockdown. So ah, literally, awesome. yeah, I mean, everything just like went and it's complete lockdown. No drive throughs no nothing. I mean... Nothing. Yeah, yeah. yeah, so it's and, a different. And you guys are Canadian? Did I get that right? We're yeah, so we're half Canadian, half Swiss, actually. So where'd you grow up or whatever? Canada. I grew up in yeah. Canada and then spent uh three and a half years in Switzerland when I was sixteen to twenty. So nice. the best years of your life. <laughs> yeah. yeah. It was really fun. You you got bummed out when you were in Switzerland last. You went to go and it was you were got rained out, right? Oh my god, yeah. We went down for the uh the, the golden eye bungee there on <laughs> Uh, on the, the border of Italy at the Brzezaska Dam and um, it was like a monsoon and me and my buddy uh, who I've gone bungee jumping with a bunch of times he lives in Zurich so we drove down and man they're like yeah you can go uh, and it was like hurricane winds and like monsoon rains and we're like yeah nah that doesn't sound like a smart idea <laughs> <laughs> you're like jump off and go right into the wall the cliff or something like that 15 years ago, I wouldn't have even thought about Even 10 years ago, I wouldn't have even thought about not doing it. And I was just like, you know what? Screw this. <laughs> oh, my gosh. So what does it feel like right now for you? I mean, for us, because we're out of our home country, it feels like we're still somewhat traveling, if you will, even though we're not sightseeing and stuff. But what does it feel like to be a traveler like you are? <laughs> and um, have that thought of, I can't leave. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's, been, it's been tough. It's been an adjustment for me. But, like, I, you know, I have a lot... I don't even know what I have going on, but I find myself like being busy. I mean, I, I feel um, I go stir crazy sometimes, but I mean, like I said, I can go outside. I mean, I've been exercising a lot, like, uh, you know, I have access to weights and, uh, you know, I'm walking eight, 10 miles a day. So, I mean, you know, I'm keeping busy and, and New York's fun to like walk around and it's, it's nice because there's not a lot of people and it's pretty easy to social distance once you get off like the main roads. Yeah. Um, yeah. And people are being pretty, pretty respectful. I mean, the only huge difference is I, I can't really go travel. I mean, I could, but I, I'm not going to. And uh, I can't go to restaurants or bars. I mean, I can still order in or, you know, pick up or whatever, but you just can't sit in a restaurant, which, you know, whatever, save a bunch of money that way. 
Yeah, yeah, it's amazing, right? I mean, I guess that's the difference too. The the United States, every country has a different level of lockdown, right? You guys can still right. order on Amazon and, and online deliveries are still happening. And here they've had so few cases and yet they're still, they don't even have online delivery opened up yet. So yeah, yeah, yeah. pretty crazy. Yeah. So they're extremely over the top um, cautious, <laughs> but yeah. they eradicate it, I guess, so. Well, New Zealand has a great prime minister. I mean, she seems like she's awesome. She's so, amazing. I mean, if there's a prime minister that I'd love to hang out with, she's the one. <laughs> yeah, I mean, like, she's like our age, right? I mean, she seems like she'd be fun she's, to, like, go out and drink with her. We're, we're, like, getting old. I'm getting old. I don't know how old you are, but I'm like, she's younger than us. I'm like, this is crazy, you know? It's just wild. Yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm in my 40s. I just, <laughs> yep. I'm 41 now. She's, so, like, in yeah. her 30s. She's in her 30s. Yeah. And she's yeah. a mom, and she addresses the young kids, and she's just, mm. I don't know, she's got everything going. She's she's amazing. So yeah, the yeah. country, this country rocks. I, I uh, was listening to one of your um, interviews and suddenly, and you said New Zealand would be one of the top countries you would move to. And yeah. what were some of the others you said, if you can pick countries to live? Mexico? Yeah, the uh, Australia, New Zealand, South Africa, Mexico, Canada. Um, yeah, I could live anywhere in Europe too, any of the, the Western European Mediterranean countries. But I mean, those would probably be my top choices. Speaking English is, of course, nice. And um, I'm, I'm big outdoors nature. So, I mean, it's hard to be in New Zealand, especially the South Island. I mean, uh, yeah. I don't know if you guys have had a chance to explore the South Island and, and whatnot, but it's just mm -hmm. unbelievable. We tried and then we got stopped by the police and yeah. told to go home. <laughs> we were like let's just go for a little nature drive you know like we're not yeah. nothing we weren't gonna do anything and and it's so natural and open here that even if you get out of the car you're not gonna bump into people you know but no they're they've got it right like extreme lockdown right now so they they're yeah, like yeah. where are you going we're like to the grocery store they're like no turn her up <laughs> that didn't well, work at least you got to look at mountains so the remarkables <laughs> are quite remarkable uh well we we have a view we this is what i see look at this i'll just quickly show you this is our view Oh man, that doesn't suck. Yeah, I, I know that view well. Yeah. <laughs> so if you're gonna be in quarantine, now's it. Like it's like a really nice spot to be in quarantine, right? So, yeah, yeah, it's not that bad. So, anyway. so what's your guys' story? So what's your guys' story? You guys are trying to go to every country. You got you travel with your kids. Like yeah. what's going on? Uh, yeah. So basically, what you did now. I mean, this is totally different because you did this all as a young guy. You know, when you go with three kids, it's a whole different ball game. Like some of the stories you would have faced specifically and maybe you know and just to back this up what i'm thinking is a lot of people said or maybe two or three people said do all the hard countries first so that the easy countries are like a breeze well we did the opposite so we've done all the easy countries and now we're starting to get into like you know some of the harder ones we're like we have no idea how we're even going to get in like yeah. i would love for you to share your story on libya and uh where you had to like smile and show your teeth <laughs> <laughs> yeah um, so Libya was my last country that, for 193, and um, I, I had arranged this whole trip with uh, with my uncle actually in March of 2011 uh, to go to my last. I think it was like four or five, six countries, whatever it was. It was all these like really romantic places like Sudan and Algeria and Djibouti and Somalia, and then Libya was okay. was going to be the last one. And uh, that was when the Arab Spring happened, and you know Tunisia and Egypt, and then it went over into uh, Libya. And Gaddafi was on the run, and the U.S. got involved, and it became a no-fly zone. So I was able to go to all the other countries except for Libya. Uh, so I had to go home, and I uh, couldn't go. And, you know, I was so close, and I was annoyed. And well, what am I going to do? I'm not going to risk my life, or at least I didn't think I was going to. Uh, and then I, I get an email in August of that year, in 2011. The war's still going on. Uh, it was about four or five days until Gaddafi was to eventually be killed. Uh, and he goes, uh, the rebels have seized control of Eastern Libya. And I think you can get into Libya from the Western Egypt border. And literally I was at Kennedy an hour later and, uh, I was flying to Cairo. I had dinner with this guy who, uh, who I've known for years. And, uh, I get on a plane to this little desert outpost called Mursa Mutra, which no one's ever heard of. It's about 300 miles from the border. I had uh, $5,000 cash on me and I figured I would have to bribe somebody um and i speak two words of arabic I, I land in this little place where no one speaks english i see a guy wearing a sport coat and a libyan rebel lapel pin so i go to him i'm like oh excuse me sir you speak english he goes yes and i go tell him what i'm trying to do and he goes wow that's crazy uh but um and i'm like yeah, can you help me get a taxi to the border and explain to him what i'm doing and he goes what are you gonna do that i'm like i don't know and uh, he's like I i'm gonna do better than this my brother's coming from tobruk libya with a uh, minivan 
so just come with us. And I'm like, yeah, okay, sure. Sounds good. Thanks. You know? <laughs> and uh, so I get in the back of a minivan with this, these two Arab guys, Libyan guys who I've never met before. Um, they didn't ask for anything. I offered money. He said, no. Uh, so we get to the border. Um, we're in line. It's a long line, three cars from the actual border. All of a sudden on the other side, Chinese smugglers in this huge truck are trying to smuggle fake Marlboro cigarettes from Libya into Egypt. And <laughs> They, uh, they didn't want to pay a tariff in Egypt, so they were trying to sneak in the back door. The, uh, the Libyan rebels at the border wanted them to pay. Obviously, the Chinese didn't want to pay. They start arguing, and then they start shooting each other. Oh, my and, gosh. <laughs> yeah, my, uh, the minivan I was in gets hit three times, and I'm, like, freaking out, screaming at the guys to, like, back up, you know, go to the desert, like, blah, blah, blah. He, uh, you know, these guys, the, the brother doesn't speak English and the other guy's screaming at him in Arabic and I'm freaking out thinking I'm going to die at the border here. And uh, anyway, we back out about three quarters of a mile into the desert and we just sit there and watch these guys shoot each other. And uh, about three hours later, the guy's like, okay, I think it's safe to go to the border again. And I'm like, yeah, all right, whatever. And <laughs> this uh, time, were you traumatized a little bit? Were you in shock? I mean, come on. I, I didn't even have time. To, I mean, I, it was a couple of hours, but I was so like transfixed on what was happening, like trying to uh, be aware of what, what was going on in case I had to run or like I had no idea, you know. And uh, anyway, we go back to the uh, the border, and you know, I was a lot bigger than these guys. I'm like, am I gonna have to beat them up and like steal the car and drive back to Egypt? Like, I didn't know what I was gonna have to do. And um, anyway, we get back to the border, and the guy goes, uh, "Give me your passport." I give him my passport. And he whispers some words in Arabic to his brother. And then he turns to me and goes, okay, here's the deal. Uh, you're going to tell them you're a humanitarian dentist uh, going into Libya to do dental work. And I'm like, I'm not a dentist. And he goes, doesn't matter. You have straight white teeth. Just smile and point to your teeth. And that's all you need to do. I'm like, <laughs> okay. So we get to the border. You're probably thinking like, is this going to work? Like, seriously, come on. I mean, I, I've been in enough of these ridiculous borders where I know these people are not exactly road scholars, you know what I mean? So uh, I, I figured, you know, it would either come down to money or just them being stupid. So, so uh, yeah, anyway, we get to the thing. He whispers some words in Arabic to the uh, border guy. He takes my passport, looks at it, looks at me, and then he uh, kind of smiles, goes like this, and I do the exact same thing back to him. He gives me a thumbs up and hands me my passport and literally in English says, welcome to Libya. Oh and that was it. And that was it. This is crazy because they do not issue visas for Libya. I mean, you cannot get into that country right now. So uh, that's that's actually false. You can. Uh, you got to go with untamed borders. That's the only way you can get in. Uh, there's one guy who can get you in, and he'll set you up with a guy in the country. I can get you a contact if you need it because I plan to go to Tripoli uh, okay. when this is over at some point. Oh, there you go. So I have to do what. <laughs> <laughs> because there's certain countries where like we, we don't know how we're gonna do this especially with three kids like what do you say you go I'm working for the oil company and these are my associates you know that, that, that's exactly it you say you're working for an oil company and you get a fixer uh, my buddy was just there and you, you, you know in these countries you have a guy who knows a guy and, and literally that's how it works are you talking about Drew because I, I saw yeah, how I Drew got in and I was like oh my gosh Drew you're hilarious yeah. <laughs> that's yeah. crazy well you've traveled with Drew quite a bit no you guys have done yeah. a few countries together yeah, I think we've been out of the seven or eight countries now. I mean, I, I literally was just talking to him. I, I talk to him every day. So. Oh, cool, cool, cool. Yeah, he's a cool guy. Very fun. Um, that's nuts. So tell me, everyone always says the same things to us. Like, what is your favorite countries? And or, what is your this? Or what is your that? Or least, uh, you know, all, the same questions over and over. And I think it's really hard to pinpoint, you know, the best ones. So if we were to share with our viewers, like, some of the top places we would live, you were saying, like, New Zealand is one, Mexico is one. And then what are some of the, like you were saying Europe, but what are some of the top reasons that you choose? Like you were saying eco places where you can nature and hike or walk or things like that. Um, what is, you said language, like being able to speak the language, that's probably top for living. I would say places that are kind of similar to the US or Canada and Canada being one of them where they have like a variety of landscapes, like beaches and mountains and deserts and great cities and islands. Basically it just has varied landscapes. You can do a lot of different things. It's mm -hmm. helpful to speak English, but, um, you know, you have access to everything you need, like a big city, you know, get out into the desert, mountains, country, you know, go to a Hawaii, go to a beautiful island, you know what I mean? That type yeah. of thing. So, yeah. you know, c countries with everything. And I think all those countries I mentioned have just about yeah. everything. Yeah, because it's very different to visit and then to live, right? So if you're considering yeah. where you're going to live, a lot of people are at that age where they're like, oh, where can I go retire or where can I live? And now's actually a really good time to see which countries are kind of coming to the top right? With a crisis. 
it's a really cool yeah. time to analyze and see which countries are kind of like the safe places if you're looking for a safe zone or medically like where's the good spots to be or you know all those those things that are important as people get older yeah i mean aside aside from medical uh like there's really no advantage to living in america right now so uh you know i mean i'm not i'm not leaving but uh you know there's a lot of reason not to live here right now so yeah wow well um, so our girls always get asked the question do you miss anything while you're traveling so when you go out first of all do you guys like when you go on your own do you often go alone or do you go with someone or and then do you spend like months at a time or shorter trips or is it all varied um i, I used to spend months at like not not necessarily months but like sometimes months uh but several weeks to you know about six to eight weeks was about the max i would do because I like to be home and try to have a normal life and like that type of stuff. And nowadays I pretty much, uh, I think the longest trip I've done in the past five, eight, 10 years has probably been about three weeks. So oh, wow. and, and nowadays I get like antsy after about two weeks anyway. So, so I like to, okay. you don't really miss anything. You don't really end up missing anything at all. Cause you know, you're going to be back home in like three weeks, four weeks, whatever it is. Yeah, I mean, that's kind of the idea. So then you enjoy your, your trips more also. And like, I mean, really, uh, you know, I don't know. I mean, most places except for like sub-Saharan Africa are pretty wet in, in Central Asia and stuff are pretty westernized. Like you can get your fix on food, which is usually the thing that uh, you start craving the most um, from home. At least like you feel comfortable eating stuff if you've been eating crap for a while. Yeah. Um, so for me, I mean, you know, I don't know. I'm pretty good at this point. But yeah, I don't like to be away from home for that long. That's cool. And then what about um, so? Like I look, I think of all the countries we visited and I think some of the more challenging ones that we go to is mainly some of the African countries. Um, mm -hmm. Would you say, what are like some of the challenges you've had while you're in that continent? Cause those are, we've only been to 10 African countries. So we have, you know, a good 44, there's 44, 54. we have quite a few left to do. Yeah, I think there's so, 54 in Africa or 53 yeah, or something. We got to be 44, I think we've done 10. So yeah. we're getting into, and we've done, I feel like, most of the easy ones, right? So, yeah. <laughs> again, so what are some of the challenges you would you are going to tell us we're going to be facing soon? The, the the biggest challenge with Africa is two. Well, three things. Uh, number one, visas. Uh, visas are a pain in the butt. Uh, there's no way around it. I suggest you get them in advance to eliminate the hassles of getting them on the ground and delays and bribes and all the other stuff. Uh, and and two, you're going to realize that the worst places in the world are the most expensive places in the world too. So you're going to, uh, you know, you're going to see how expensive things is, especially if you're buying plane tickets for like five people. Yeah. Um, you know, I don't know how yeah. old your kids are, but uh, it, it gets, uh, it gets expensive and food's expensive. Hotels are expensive because there's usually only like one nice hotel or, you know, that you would feel comfortable staying in in each place and they really jack you. Um, and I don't know how you guys travel if you get two rooms or one, but you know, the, the costs add up. And then third, logistics. Logistics are a pain because um you either have to basically hire a driver especially in west and central africa to get you around from place to place um because there's infrequent flights and then they connect in like weird times and weird places and you, you're constantly connecting in senegal or ethiopia or kenya and uh, sometimes the layovers can be like 48 hours it's like ridiculous you know yeah. and there's no rhyme or reason sometimes they just cancel flights and they don't tell you and you get to the airport and you're like, what the hell, you know? <laughs> Africa so. in general, when we, when we tend to go, we, we say to ourselves, okay, expectations are like this. Yeah. And so then that way, if anything happens good, we're, we're like happy about it. And we just have to expect that everything's going to go wrong or nothing's going to work. And then, and then that way we're not too like upset or shocked by it. And uh, for the most part, like I said, we went to some of the easier countries, but we still had, those are more of our rougher times traveling. Right. So um, it'll be interesting. Yeah. Yeah, it's just, um, yeah, managing expectations and, and you got to have the right attitude and, and not get too upset about it because things are going to go wrong. It just happens. But that's yeah, part yeah. of the adventure. I mean, I would say Africa is my favorite place to travel in um, because the landscapes are the best in the world. Like, really, they are. But like everything else drives you crazy. It's like that that joke saying, but it's so, so true, TIA, this is Africa. Oh, it's yeah. completely true. Cool. There's a reason, you know, it's like stereotypes. There's a reason that, where, you know, they come from. We started from. saying, hurry up and wait. <laughs> Exactly, exactly, exactly. 
And, yeah, but that's uh, been part of the fun. And and for us, when we see other travelers who are doing it, or we we watch some of the people who've done it, it makes us laugh hysterically because we're like, oh, we remember what that's like. And then we just think it's hilarious, you know. But sometimes when you're going through it, you know, but that's part of the journey. I mean, for every, it's not definitely not for everyone, but for some people, it's it's so much fun to see how other people live, what it's like, and experience it firsthand. It's so it's so enriching and so cool. So yeah. yeah. Well, it seems like you got the right attitude. So you guys will be fine. You just got to, uh, you know, patience, 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 patience. That's uh, that's Africa right there. And I don't have any patience, but in Africa, I have as me- as much as humanly possible. <laughs> <laughs> oh my gosh! So cool. What else can I ask you? That would be really fun. Hmm. Okay, let's talk about um, costs and stuff like that. We were talking about like cost of flights and stuff. So we literally travel, believe it or not, on a really tight budget, and we manage to still do what we do. And people would think, oh, you have to be like these like multi, multi millionaires to be able to travel the world. But in reality, you can find ways to like figure it out and get the better rates and and stuff like that. And so we do things like, for example, when we were in South America, instead of flying from one country to the other, we would fly from that country South to the furthest North. And then usually it's a cheaper flight within the country might've changed by now. And then we would cross by land and then take another flight up, things like that. Right. And we always like reverse engineer the flights. We, I think you do that as well. So we see like this airport or this country is where we want to get to. And we see, okay, what are all the companies that go in? And then we figure out where do they fly from? And then can we get to that kind of, so we kind of, it's a lot of, <laughs> it's a lot of work, but we can save ourselves a whole bunch of money by doing that. I, I would say a little bit of research can save you a lot of money. And, uh, you know, if you're slightly inconvenienced, you know, like going to alternative airports or, like you said, flying to, like in Malaysia, instead of flying to Singapore, you fly to Johor Bahru and then cross the border uh, overland, you can save some money that way. I mean, it's not like really worth it, but I mean, if you wanted to, uh, you could. And in Africa, you get that quite often. And we're taking mini buses in Africa, which trust me, I've done way too much of in my life. But if you can, if you can handle it, uh, you can save a fortune. Because well, sometimes it's the only buses. way, sometimes it's the only way, like even when you pay more for like we were told oh yeah okay you're gonna pay more and it's only gonna be you and then it's like they switch drivers and all of a sudden you are stopping every five minutes you're like wait what <laughs> and uh, you're just like, but then drivers. we started doing we figured it out we're like how much does it cost to rent the whole bus and we're like we're renting the whole bus just take us direct do not stop for anyone <laughs> i have done that many times by myself i've rented the whole <laughs> bus because it's like a dollar a person i'm like yeah i'll give you 24 dollars to rent the whole goddamn thing you can't pick up any of your cousins you know i know you know everybody in the country but you can't pick any of them up <laughs> <laughs> that's hilarious oh my gosh yeah it's crazy it's so much fun Not so when do you think with all of this um you know lockdown and everything what do you kind of predict if you could <laughs> that the future of travel is going to be like, are we going to have to show a vaccination card or like we're, we're, we're on the other side of the world right now and we have to get back home eventually, or maybe we just become Kiwis. <clears throat> I don't know, but <laughs> we've considered it. We're like, <laughs> do we just stay here for ride it out for two, three more months? I don't know because you can't hop back. Like we would normally do unless you quarantine or unless things rapidly change and they start opening up certain countries. But what do you think? Uh, obviously, happen? obviously I'm sure you have, you know, other family, but I mean, you got all your family there. So there's really, you know, ride it out. Uh, I don't know. I mean, you're in a, probably the safest place on earth right now, um, or surely one of them. And uh, I, I don't know is the answer. I mean, I've heard so many different things. I, I don't know if they're going to have, if they have a vaccine for Corona, I think maybe that will be a thing like yellow fever kind of deal. Um, but as of now, I mean, there's, there's nothing really. Um, I don't know what they're going to do. I think everything they're doing is is madness right now in America. So, or not doing, I should say. So we'll see. Um, we'll see what happens. I think Canada has a better idea of what they're doing, but we we also have an unreasonable person as president right now. So we'll uh, we'll see we'll see what happens. Uh, really, um, it's kind of a wait and see here. Um, yeah, you guys are yeah. in a whole different ball game over there. I know a lot of wealthy people are trying to actually get to New Zealand. Um, by, I've heard, I don't know if this is all for real or not, but I've heard people actually before when they started seeing things happen, they started uh, a company here already and bought, you know, they already have, some of them have bigger homes um, just so that they can come in and then sponsor other people work-wise to come in and work so that they can get them out of the U.S. Like I've heard of a lot of people with um, trying to escape to their, you know, they, they've got the bunkers and underground, you know, things here that people don't really know about. <laughs> so they who knows? Themselves with, themselves with sheep. 
<laughs> oh my gosh. So who knows? I don't know. I, I'm hoping that by the summer, by the end of the summer, things will start opening up and people will start, you know, really nicely moving around. But I, I wonder really what it's going to be like. I, I think I think things are going to open toward the uh, end of summer, middle end of summer. I mean, it's, it's really hard to say. It kind of depends where you are. But it's just hard to say to say how they do it responsibly because we don't know enough about everything. We don't know if you can get reinfected. There's no uh, mass testing. Like I, I might've had it. I imagine I've definitely been exposed to it. I was in Asia in, in late last year and then I was just in three weeks in Europe uh, end of February to, to mid March. And I was at a soccer game with 90,000 people. I had to be exposed to it, but I've never once had a symptom. So but I can't get tested. I have no idea, you know? Yeah. Well, yeah, I guess that'll change everything if they start opening tests to, to everyone um, to see and to see if we've had, like, uh, the is it the antigens? A so, antibodies, yeah. They, antibodies. they are starting to roll that out allegedly, but I, I don't, God knows how to get it. I have no idea. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, I think that's the only solution. Um, yeah, I agree. Yeah. We'll see. <laughs> Here they yeah. tested uh, 400 random people uh, in and around Queenstown, and every single one tested negative. So that's a really good, and they're down to, I forget how many cases, but so few. And even at that, they're still staying on lockdown for one whole extra week and then only opening it to a level three, which means online shopping can resume and drive throughs So they're extremely vigilant when it comes to this whole coronavirus. And I think Again, it's it's deal with it. it was like after they had that shooting like a year or two ago and they basically just banned guns. You know, they, they do the, what's right for the greater good Whereas in America, we don't do that. It's, it's really unfortunate. I mean, it's been like that forever. Uh, I don't want to talk about politics or whatever, but what New Zealand does is what all countries should do. Yeah, they really think of the people over everything. Yep. They think of the, the good for the people, the good for the environment. I don't know if you've realized when you were here, but I'm surprised how many products are all eco-friendly and it's all about like very natural products when you read and you're like, oh my gosh, I think I, every country should be doing this. You would just think it's normal and natural, but it's not the case. So, New, New Zealand uh, and like Scandinavia, nobody does it better than those two uh, regions, really. I mean, Scandinavia, you know, everything's socialized. So everyone has a good job. Everyone has access to free health care. I mean, Canada, free health care, you know? Yeah. Um, you know, so what if you pay higher taxes? You're still paying less money than you would if you had to pay for health care and education and all this other stuff. So, I mean, we could get into that too, but New Zealand does it right. And, uh, you know, I think you're pretty good where you are right now, even though yeah. it's not home. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So long as we find a place to, to stay. Because <laughs> yeah, yeah. the hotels are all closed and like some of the, well, most people are like, you know, not really renting out or if they are, it's like the high end exclusive, you know, $400 a night places. So we'll, we'll see what happens. So it looks like a nice house you're in. Yeah. We are right now. And hopefully they'll, uh, they'll be okay to extend it for a little bit longer. We shall see. Okay. So yeah, yeah. yeah. Right. No, it's all cool. No, but I just wanted to really connect with you and just like pick your brain a little bit, share with other, our audience. They all ask all the same questions about travel and what it's like to travel. Yeah. And I mean, you, you've done it, the North and South Pole. I mean, that's crazy. That's yeah. just wild. Any fun stories there? Oh man, how much time do we have? Uh, <laughs> yeah, um, both of them, we could do an hour show on uh, each of them, but um I'll, I'll give you a real short version. Uh, the first time I went to Antarctica to try to go to the South Pole, I was down there with Prince Harry, the Prince of England, and uh, a couple of uh, movie stars from England um, in, in the UK. Uh, Christ, Dominic West, the guy from uh, The Wire and The Affair, and then Alexander Skarsgård. And, and they were down there doing a uh, walking with the wounded um, charity thing and try to get wounded soldiers like down to the South Pole for like... Uh, How did you... How did you land getting there with like the prince and all these guys? How tell us that first of all? I, I know a lot of people, and it's it's complicated to get down there, and there's only really one way to do it. So uh, everyone kind of ends up in the same uh, same place, and uh, <laughs> so we ended up doing it. I found out Harry was going, and uh, you know I was excited, you know, and uh, <laughs> but it was weird because he had just gotten busted in Vegas for doing some like you know whatever he was doing up there and like so he was all like uh standoffish to everybody <laughs> it was kind of funny and then um what ended up happening was we had bad weather and there was a plane that actually crashed and no one was hurt or anything but the plane was inoperable so the russians who control the logistics in antarctica people don't realize that the russians control all logistics within antarctica uh gave harry and his team priority to actually reach the south pole 
even though not all of them made it. Um, uh, but because he was the prince, they gave him priority. So me and my team didn't make it the first year. And then I had to go back uh, the second year at a massive cost to, uh, to make it. So Prince Harry kind of screwed me uh, the first year, but it's a fun story to tell. So I don't even mind that much. <laughs> hilarious that's crazy yeah. though oh my gosh that's yeah. such a crazy wild. story wild yeah. yeah that is so nuts I mean yeah this is like just amazing it's gonna be you did you write a book or I, I literally just started uh my book uh the other day so yeah. um cool so yes I am I am doing it yes yeah these are the stories the untold stories I think a lot of people are like did you write a book because we we make videos so we show you know the fun and the here's what you should do here and there but we don't really show all the the bad and the ugly and the you know the challenges and all the fun stuff that people should know right <laughs> but that's what my book's gonna have it's gonna have like the uh, the ridiculous stuff too that you don't really talk about um yeah. the stuff uh, that you if you shared people are like you guys are nuts <laughs> yeah. there's gonna be a mini bus rider too in there as well so uh, it's, uh, man mm -hmm. i have the story in malawi I, I won't gross your audience out but um anyway it should be uh, it's gonna be pretty tell important. us your malawi story we gotta hear it now you can't say that and not say it no, it's, not, it's, it's really gross um but <laughs> <laughs> but it was uh you know sometimes the bathroom stories uh they never get told or the the funniest ones to tell you know what happened to us in malawi so we're traveling with three girls so obviously yeah. you need bathrooms it's not like you have three little boys where they can just go on the side of the road like everyone else does and you know malawi not everyone has bathrooms well we we're on a six hour drive from the north all the way to Nkata Bay. And we uh, had to stop for bathrooms because the bus, of course, even though it's six hours, sometimes it takes longer and you're picking up people every five minutes and fish and chickens and everything else in the bus and babies. And you're all like, <laughs> and my girls are like, mom, we have to go pee. And I'm like, oh my gosh, we can't, like, there's nowhere to stop. And so we get the bus driver to stop and we literally go through the little village where we were knocking on doors. Like, do you have toilets? Do you have toilets? Do you and this really nice guy welcomed us into his home and like the electricity was off because that's what happens there. And he gave us shoes because there's water in his house. And he's like, here's my flip flops. Here's the flashlight, go use the bathroom. And he was so sweet and so nice and accommodated us. And we got to use his bathrooms. I mean, it was the yeah, best bathroom toilet? story ever. Like real toilet? A real toilet. It was, wow. just, yeah, yeah. So we were right like. Right there. right there, that's a miracle right there. <laughs> <laughs> so we had a good bathroom story. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, that's a nice bathroom story. Mine, mine are all horrible, so yeah. <laughs> we thought we should do a bathroom story video of all the bathrooms in the world and rated by each country what the girls, from their perspective, because our girls are quite funny when it comes to bathrooms, so. Yeah, I, uh, as kids, you have a higher tolerance for pain, I think, than uh, as, you, as you get older. Um, <laughs> yeah, it's kind of funny. I, I'd actually love to see that one. That would be funny. <laughs> yeah. We don't have all the video clips of it, but we'd have to, we'd have to tell the story and people will just have to visualize it. <laughs> yeah, exactly. yeah. Anyway, no, I can wrap up, but thank you so much for uh, taking time together with our, our audience and sharing some fun, fun stories. Keep people under. Yeah, 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 thank you. It's a pleasure meeting you. And uh, yeah, no, uh, if, you know, anytime, this is fun. And uh, I'd love to meet, uh, meet your kids sometime. For sure. So we hope you enjoyed that conversation my mom just had with Leah Abimonti and... And make sure you subscribe because we're going to take you to every country yes. in the world and create really cool travel stories and memories for you guys all to experience. So join along on the fun. We'll see you next time. Bye!